evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out to this chat with our mayor and council tonight at the library. My name is Ken Fazer. I'm the chief librarian, and uh, I would like to ask the mayor and councillors to introduce themselves so I don't mangle someone's name and destroy my career. And while you're answering, I just thought as a bit of a uh, warm up, maybe you could answer the uh, extremely important question, flames or oilers? Hmm. Oh. Quiet in the audience, please. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lindsay Clark and I'm the mayor of Medicine Hat and I am going to plead the fifth on the Calgary Oilers question. I'm Robert Dumanowski, city councillor. Um, I did my first degree at the, in Calgary, so I would say I'm legacy um, Calgary Flames fan. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. My name's Cassie Hyder. I'm a city councillor and um, I have to say the Flames. A little uh, history about myself. I was Lanny McDonald's flower girl, so oh, wow. no choice. It's the flames. <laughs> Top that one, McGrogan. I can't. Andy McGrogan, uh, Montreal story is just oh. in me, and then followed by the flames. Wow, this is like the most controversial conversation we've ever had publicly. Um, I am Ramona <laughs> Robbins, and I grew up in the 80s in Northern Alberta in Grand Prairie, so I got to see the best hockey team of all time repeatedly, so Oilers all the way for me, although it's been a long time <laughs> since there's been any success there, but that's fine. Um, it's in my heart. But I will top, maybe top, Councillor Hyder's story is the house that I reside in that I purchased when Lanny McDonald was a tiger. Um, he billeted and lived in my basement. Um, I'm Councillor Shyla Sharps and uh, hardcore Edmonton Oilers. I used to go to the games when it was Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier uh, at the, t yeah, so you can tell how old I am, but there you go, it was awesome. Hi, I'm Allison Van Dyke and um, I, this is, sounds terrible, but I don't follow sports. <laughs> but my husband is from St. Albert and a big Oilers fan, so I'm going to say Oilers. Well, maybe big Oilers fan is an exaggeration, but he's an Oilers fan, so I'm going to say Oilers. <clears throat> and, and Oilers is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> so panelists, I've heard that you've done a few town halls in the last few weeks. How did that go? That's a joke. <laughs> Members of the public, I think we all know um, that these folks have been to some heated public discussions of late. I think it's fair to expect elected officials to answer tough questions, but I also think these folks have heard the message. They understand the pain points the community is going through, and they've had some point, pain points of their own during past public meetings. And so I request and ask, uh, let's not inflict any pain tonight, please. There's going to be room for tough questions tonight, but I suggest to you that we will accomplish more in this meeting if we are civil and respectful. I, for one, hope to hear thoughtful, deep responses and discussions, and that doesn't happen when people are yelling. We asked for questions to be submitted ahead of time, and as of 2 p.m. today, we had 33 questions, which is a fair number for a 90-minute event. We've taken more questions tonight. There is a box outside, um, if you uh, didn't see it, where you can submit questions, which we will ask as time permits. Uh, I'm going to shorten and combine some questions because, not surprisingly, some of the questions are very similar to each other, uh, but the panel has received all of them, so they've heard uh, everything that was submitted. So we're going to cover, we have a couple themes that we want to go over tonight. Uh, one sort of uh, bucket or theme, I would say, is arts and culture and recreation as well. And uh, um, the other one is the downtown neighborhood, and I'm putting in the Strong Towns initiative with that because downtown is one of the areas that it's concerned with. And then at the end, we're going to have some time to talk about other topics. I wonder what might come up. Who knows? <laughs> Could be anything. So let's start with arts and culture, and we'll start with questions that were submitted to us online. So the first question is, uh, exactly how much is the city paying strong towns to consult our city? A dollar figure, please. Anybody want to? Oh, and I should say that this is very informal and uh, uh, councillors and the mayor can just jump in as they want. The mayor might uh, direct questions if she thinks that that's, you know, um, appropriate, but otherwise just please jump in. Yeah, so it is about $200,000 $200, over two years, um, $212,000 over 12 for two years and um right now we're that we're in the first phase which is uh, mostly a learning phase uh the strong towns group has been working closely with 
um, all of our city departments to determine how we can be more nimble. Uh, one of my favorite things from Strong Towns is that you just try, take small risks with potentially big wins and you just try things. And if it doesn't work, you win because you learned that it didn't work and you haven't really lost out on that much. So that's what I, I hope that's sort of a cultural change that can happen in the city. And of course, then the um, look, figuring out the long term liabilities for the city so that we can uh, be financially strong now and into the future. Does anyone else want to comment? Sure. Thanks, Ken. Um, I think I can speak for myself that um, when this uh, came to council and there were some questions I would say for myself in regards to how this works, um, I'm still learning a lot about the philosophy of it. Um, I think I'm kind of old school when I think of development, I think of the outside of the community and, and the surrounding area, whereas Strong Towns is definitely inside the inner city. Um, but for that, for myself, it's still a learning process. I find it hard to find a lot of good information um, from them, but um, like I said, for myself, I'm learning more about the process. So Maybe I'll have a follow-up question or a comment. Um, $200,000 uh, budget for this, city budget is about $130 million. This is a pretty, I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money uh, in the context of that. Do you think it's important that people uh, think about uh, sort of uh, budgets of this size, is that a valid or an important uh, thing? Or is this the sort of thing that uh, you would like to just uh, have a little bit of room to, to do these things of this size? Any thoughts on that? Just uh, briefly, I think every penny, it makes a difference. Yeah. And uh, we can't say, well, it's only 200,000, but yeah. 200,000 is a lot of money. Um, every penny is. So we're in it now, so we should engage fully. We should t take some lessons from it that uh, it will bring value to our citizens and we, I, they're big into infill and I, I, I really like how all that all sounds. So um, I want to acknowledge first off, it is a lot of money. And mm -hmm. secondly, we need to fully engage. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about uh, strong towns as well. And I just rephrased it to, to, to shrink it down a little bit. Um, some councillors seem more enthusiastic about strong towns and some seem less enthusiastic. Would any councillor like to explain their thoughts on the project that might differ from the differ from the group consensus? Because it's okay to think different. Yeah, I can. Um, so I, I'm liking strong towns. I'm not going to say that I am 100% all in supportive. I am one of those people. Strong towns. When I look at strong towns, it's about walkable communities, uh, and I think that's all really good. But I think there is also a balance. Not everybody wants to be in a walkable community. I like living on the edge of town where nobody knows where I am all by myself and I can walk my dogs and not see anybody. And that might sound awful, but it's the truth. So do I really want to be downtown uh, walkable? Nope. I'm also, I love my car. I'm not going to lie. I love the fact that I can get up in my car and drive. It doesn't make me a bad human. I just think that there's, uh, when you're looking at a community like Medicine Hat, there's different people and different needs. And there's nothing wrong with trying to have a community that meets more than one need. So my need is there. And for now, maybe when I hit 60, it won't be. But right now, I'm happy on the edge of town. So, but I'm not opposed to this either. So I really like it. I think it's really good for infill. And I think it's really good as a process. I just don't want it to be a forcible decision. Can I just, just chime in here yeah. um, briefly? So I think that when, what I've seen is people narrow down about what they don't like. Oh, that wouldn't work here. That wouldn't work there. To me, Strong Towns is not about applying their philosophy to us, but taking pieces of it that work for Medicine Hat. And so this beginning stage has just been gathering information and sharing information about some of their philosophies. But in the end, and I've said this to people via email several times who were um, conflicted about it, is that ultimately the council makes the decision. We haven't delegated, nor can we delegate decision making to any strong towns um, principles. But the next phase is really going to be all about public input. And so what I like about Strong Towns personally is it, it requires us to look and say, and you know this in your own houses, right? Like, 
if we keep doing it the same way all the time, then we never learn anything different. And we need to look at it and say, is this the best way of doing this? Is this the best way of arranging my cupboard? Is this the best way of organizing my kids' laundry? We're just like constantly saying what's the best. And those are like small, maybe silly little examples, but we can all relate to them, right? So when you are considering strong towns as a philosophy, my point is you don't need to adopt all of it. But when we go and we look and say, just because the city of Medicine Hat has always done things this way, that may not necessarily be the right way. But having a facilitator outside of the city who can sort of ask us, and they have been asking staff these tough questions, why do you do, why do you budget like this? Why do you do this? I think we're going to end up with a really great result. But the decision making doesn't get delegated. And I think that's something that I've heard from several people. Um, so I'm excited for the community involvement stage um, instead of the information gathering. And there'll be lots of opportunities to hear people's voices. And obviously, they want to be heard and we want to hear them. Councillor Dumnowski. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm not known to be brief, but I'm going to try really hard. Um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is $212,000 is a lot of money. And I don't think anyone would sit up here intentionally saying it's not. Um, it represents a quarter percent of a tax increase if we were to derive that against uh, an e equivalent factor towards a tax increase it would be a quarter percent um, for me it's all about value for money and i know those are magical words but um, as former chair of audit and and council hirsch i believe is on audit uh, currently um, one of the things that we've often uh, done and continue to do is look for value for money so sometimes you have to spend money to save money and I think to um, bolster some of the points that were made, um, sometimes you get in, it, I wouldn't call it a habit, but you, you maintain certain standards, certain practices, and, and they're effective, and you, you balance that against best practice. But until you have somebody who's coming uh, from the outside, sometimes you don't have the same opportunity to look at it and reflect on it and, and manage it differently. Um, I didn't campaign on strong towns, but a number of these fine people up here did. And my role as an incumbent counselor was to say, you know what, we have new ideas and we have uh, new motivations from people. And so it's coming upon me to support that. And hopefully in the end, it does derive a value for money for our city. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, how do we cope with the animosity to the Strong Towns concept, uh, particularly because it's a US consultant? Uh, Councillor Van Dyke, do you wanna weigh in? <laughs> Or, I don't know, do I? <laughs> sure. I think, um, I mean, we're a culture of people who come from all over the world and good ideas can come from anywhere. And so um, I, I think this is a group of people who have identified an issue that's kind of specific to North America and are looking to want to solve it. And um, I'm excited. We're not exactly the same as the U.S., but when it comes to development, uh, development styles are very similar in communities and so um, I think that there's a lot that can be learned from this group and again uh, to echo what many people have said here this is um, in essence kind of a mentorship program so it's taking ideas and processes and applying them with our own people to our own community to see how we can resolve our own issues so they are um, I'm not going to say the experts, but they are uh, right now in North America a well-recognized, well-respected uh, organization doing the work to help communities to become more fiscally sustainable into the future. And maybe just to build on um, what Councillor Robbins said earlier, we are looking eventually like to for made in Medicine Hat solutions. So uh, it's all about that bottom-up approach where you're um, sourcing ideas and um, empowering the momentum that already exists in the community so that um, instead of working against sometimes, you know, community groups or ideas that are developed in the community, we're really empowering and working with those ideas. And the, <clears throat> the final Strong Towns question isn't really a Strong Towns question, but it has the words in it. So we'll, we'll put it out there right now. And it's a bit of a tough one. Uh, Strong Towns doesn't come from a third party. It comes from leadership from the mayor and council. What are you doing to show leadership? 
You're all here tonight. I, I'm just I'm here right now answering tough questions on the stage <laughs> with bright lights. Um, They're very bright up here. And I'm always happy to answer questions when people e email them to try to help them understand. When I'm at a council meeting, if I'm making a decision, I try to tell you the factual basis that helps me make that decision. And I certainly take input from people. And sometimes I have to get to the point where it's, you know, ar getting argumentative. And I have to say, we'll just have to agree to disagree. And that d is not always a satisfactory answer to people when they want me to adopt their point of view. But I think leadership is just staying, staying true to yourself and what you know and what you believe, taking the input and then filtering it out. So I, I think I show leadership in, in lots of ways, but that accountability to me is important. It's not just saying yes, is it? Um, I think all of us that um, have uh, were elected and uh, sit up here and through all our uh, different journeys through our council um, have shown um, we all have an invested we invested interest in the community. Um, if not this job, another job, we play roles within the community, whether it's nonprofit, business owners retirees, um, however it is, um, but we all wanted to be involved in the community at a different level and give back. I think that's part of our role within the community. I'm sure right now none of us can go to the grocery store without being asked a question, whether it's positive or negative, um, but I like that part. I like that feeling of people wanting to know more and, and, and are drawn to us for different things. So. Um, I think it's just part of the role when you put your name forward, like you're going to be part of a leadership group within the community. Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in? I can just chime in a little <clears throat> bit on this one. Uh, some good comments, obviously. And I think one thing that is unique, maybe not unique about this position, but leadership is a couple of things in this case in council. It's being available, being accessible, showing up at things. Mm -hmm. and uh and being able to change your mind sometimes yeah. i find that's that's a tough one but you sit around that table and you hear some really good debate and uh, i've changed my mind several times on issues that i thought i went in thinking a certain way so uh, but after hearing some really great comments from other folks um, sometimes you have to change your mind do what's right rather than where you're stuck on yes can you just jump in ken uh, yeah great comments and um I could uh, be accused of looking up on my phone and looking up the definition of leadership. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, when it comes to this term, uh, you're looking for, uh, like every term, transparency. And I think what is that germane to this question is, is this council get long? Are we not? We're, we're hearing a lot of um, constructive um, criticism um, and, and we're trying to make sense of it. And the fact of the matter is a good, working group has candor and that's something i would say for sure this group has um, we're willing to say it we have to be mindful of how we say it sometimes and mm -hmm. and the tone we're, we're taking but uh, candor is very important and when you think about transparency at its root it is about um, being vulnerable us sitting up here in front of you um, answering your questions answering your emails meeting you where you're at um, and then navigating through tough times. I, I, we're in a good position as a city, but we're also um, on a global level amidst uh, some difficult situations. And that utility issue, I'm sure it'll come up, has certainly been a push point for a lot of people. So we, we all up here, I can tell you, welcome um, dialogue with the community. And even if it's hot and heavy, we're here to, um, to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, the next two questions are fairly longly uh, worded and um, they're pretty similar, so I'm going to put them together into one question. Why doesn't the city have a program or policy to identify homes that are substandard, energy inefficient, or in need of destruction? And from the second question, what is the city doing to make sure absentee property owners are maintaining curb appeal? So I can start this one, but I know that there are some, some councillors who um, have had uh, direct communication with with some neighborhoods, uh, members of neighborhoods experiencing these issues. So ultimately, um, a private property owner owns their private property. And within the law of the city and the province, they're 
pretty much allowed to do whatever they want with that property. Um, there are limitations, as I mentioned, if it's unsightly, if it's a dangerous property, uh, the, M the Municipal Government Act and, and our um, we have a bylaw that does allow um, bylaw officers to go in and issue tickets and um, take some other uh, issue orders and, and take some other measures there. Uh, but it is always a balance between, you know, protecting the neighborhood and, you know, respecting an individual's right to, to um, do with their property what they want to. Um, we don't want to be overly aggressive in terms of, you know, demanding that people have their property the way that, like, someone else in their neighborhood might wish them to have it because it is their property but once it gets meets the the test of an unsightly property or a nuisance property then um, there are steps that uh, bylaw officers within the city can take um i was thinking of you andy but yeah council mcgrogan yeah thank you um so the, it's a really good question here and uh i i had the the privilege of touring a down. I'm look, just looking in the audience. See if anybody's here from that group right now in the downtown near the downtown area. There's a couple of blocks that are, uh, you know, houses are boarded up, and you know the homeless are sleeping on the back porches and what have you not. And it's a concern for the neighborhood. And after you know walking through it, I can I can see why there's some concern. Uh, so my question is, it's it, it, it's it's obviously uh, unsightly in some cases. Uh, but again, is it is it really bylaw enforcement, or is there other what what I'm having administration check on right now? Is there other things that we can do in relation to taxes and you know the cleanup and and so I think some of these we've just got to I think be more vigilant in assessing the properties, uh, looking at the disturbance that may be causing because of its unsightliness and abandonment, and and what can we do to have the citizens that do live there feel safer in their neighborhood. And uh, I know I'm still kind of, well, I'm just, it was just pretty much a fresh concern. I'm waiting for some reply on that. Uh, so it is a concern and it's a valid question. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's an affordability issue as well with mm -hmm. maintaining mm -hmm. standards, which is important now than, more than ever. <clears throat> Any other comments on that one? Okay, our next uh, questions, I have three of them and they're really all uh, getting at the same thing, which is basically uh, downtown marginalized populations and uh, the challenges that they produce. I'll just read the first one the way that it's worded. Um, why are the downtown homeless population, why is the downtown homeless population allowed to victimize people and business interests in the area? Uh, some of the other questions mentioned specifically, uh, you know, the homeless strategy um, and how that's gone and uh, bank machines downtown and the difficulty with using those. Also, uh, the one comment um, uh, mentions, um, is there not a warm place that th they could go in the winter aside from the library? Could the old arena be used or is this too expensive? Thoughts? Uh, th there's quite a large um, policing public safety aspect of that. So I'm wondering if um, Councillor Van Dyke or Councillor Sharps who sit on the police commission might uh, want to weigh in. first. Yeah, sure. Um, I absolutely can. So during this question, I'm uh, looking at some of the information that was provided with the question. And part of the question was, why can't we have more police patrolling? Because we have the largest police force per capita. So I'm going to dispel that right now. We absolutely do not. So the average per capita is about 185 across Alberta. It's 185 police officers for every 100,000. And we're at 170. So we are not. We are right in the middle of the range. Um, and, and it just seems to fluctuate all over the province, but we have Rocky Mountain House. For, so here's a good example that's substantially smaller than Medicine Hat and it's okay. per capita is 201 police officers for every 100,000. So it's not just cut and dry. Medicine Hat's got the highest per capita, they're the highest paid, they can do more. So it's just not reality. So it's a narrative that's been sticking around the community, but it's, it's time to deal with some facts. Um, and as far as the pay, no, they're still, um, right in the middle, like so if you look at the union negotiations and all these numbers are actually, um, they're all visible. So it isn't that hard to get this information. We're, we're pretty much stable across the province. One of the things is as a community member, I, you know, I was born here, I live here my entire life, well not my entire life, in and out. Um, but I want to be able to attract good, good uh, personnel and good skill and if we if we're trying to aim to be the lowest payer in the province, I, I don't see how that's a good thing. Um, who would want to move here? So 
we're, I don't think we should take pride in saying we are the lowest paid police force in Alberta. I just don't think that's what we want to do. I want our city to be a good employer. I want our police to have good benefits and wages. I want to be able to attract the cream of the crop. And we can't do that if we are trying to undercut everybody and show how cheap we are. Uh, Councilor Van Dyke, do you want to um, address the, um, the safety concerns in the downtown that uh, whether actual, um, some of the uh, perceived safety issues um, with respect to um, the uh, homeless or vulnerable population downtown? Um, yeah, I can just mention a few things. Um, so I, I don't know if many people here ever read the uh, police commission uh, agendas. No. <laughs> But we receive statistics on callouts, and surprisingly, there is virtually no violent crime in the downtown core. It's it's usually more issues of loitering and that kind of a situation. But there's actually surprising lack of of actual um, chargeable offenses occurring in the downtown. So um, I think you know we have a lot of agencies that serve. Uh, a very specific population down here and that's why we have a lot of people down here accessing services but we do have more than adequate services in this community we have amazing not-for-profit and charitable organizations that provide 24-hour um, shelter care so um, if people are concerned about that we do have daytime and nighttime shelters in Medicine Hat available with more than adequate beds um, we have hot meal programs and um, all kinds of additional services available. We have um, amazing community housing organization that can house people if they choose to be housed. And again, we can't force people to do anything. People have free will. They have the opportunity to either accept that help or, or refuse it if they so choose to. And so some people have chosen not to avail themselves of the services in our community, but that doesn't mean that they're not available. Um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention that we have available through our police service is um, the crime prevention through environmental design, which is a program that uh, we have officers trained in where they can come out for free to your place of business and um, assess it and see if there are certain things that you can do just to reduce the risk of crime on your property. So whether that's lighting or some infrastructure or um, building things, they are happy to do that. So you can reach out to Medicine Hat Police Service for that service. Thank you. Councillor Hyder. Thanks, Ken. Um, I think I'd just like to weigh in here on, on these, this question. Um, I've grown up here my whole life. I'm um, third generation Hatter. That's my big, another claim to fame. Um, but what we're seeing in our community, I'm sure the people that have lived here, we, I've never seen before in my life. And um, it's not like Medicine Hat is the only place this is happening. It's an epidemic across um, the country. Um, you know, with the addiction, mental illness, and the homeless population, it's, I wish we had an answer. Like, an, just, yeah, let's do that. And um, we can help people. We can get people well. We can find them a place to live. But it's, it's a lot more complicated than what are we going to do with the issues of downtown. Um, it does sadden me that um, to see these people um, um, in and amongst um, the downtown business owners and, and that there are some issues that do come to, to site. And, um, and I would love to sit down with anyone who has, you know, some, some suggestions or, you know, problem solving for this because it does sadden me that this is what's happening to our community. Um, and again, it's not an easy fix, but I would love to have some, if anyone has suggestions or ideas. I mean, I was watching a thing on Vancouver the other night and what goes on there, it just, it's everywhere. It would just be nice if we could have some small steps to some sort of progress. Further that, to that, um, as Councillor Heider mentioned, it is a complex uh, problem that Im involves multi layers of government as well as you know policing public safety uh, and the city of Medicine Hat partnered with Medicine Hat Community Housing in June to hold a summit that brought together uh, a 
wide group of um, participants from business, residents, uh, social servicing agencies, other levels of government to l really look at what the issues are, where the gaps are, and then most importantly, what the solutions are. And so that summit happened in June. A uh, report out uh, is available on the Medicine Hat Community Housing Society website. And the Medicine Hat, Med City of Medicine Hat is also working through a response. <clears throat> that was just the first step. Uh, there will be additional summits and additional uh, community consultation. Although we recognize that there's a provincial element and uh, a federal element to housing and, you know, inflationary pressures on on all residents of Medicine Hat. Uh, we want to do what we can as a municipality to work with those partners and the community or community organizations that we have in the city to do what we can to solve the problem or at least make it better um, because, you know, it is a it is a complex mental health um, addiction and, you know, not being able to afford where you live. So, you know, these are big challenges, but we, I think if we work together as a community and build better relationships with our, strong relationships with our other levels of government, we can make some progress. Yeah, it's not really a homelessness <clears throat> problem. It's homelessness plus a whole bunch of other things. Homelessness is probably one of the smaller parts of it. Ramona? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, so I sit on the library board and we talk about the vulnerable population who spends time at the library. I um, I also sit on Medicine Net Community Housing, so I learn a lot about it that way as well. But there's some things that frankly just need to be debunked. Many of the people who are hanging out downtown, and I say hanging out, people take issue with me saying that, but so be it, they're hanging out downtown. Um, they have a place to live and what they're doing is coming to get meals because they don't make enough or um, maybe they don't have the ability to make meals or maybe that's their social group. Often when you see uh, people together downtown, it is because that's where their friends are and so that's who they're socializing with. Um, I worked, I still work downtown, I work from home primarily, but I live in the flats only a couple of blocks from the mustard seed. Um, I lived, you know, work downtown. I've talked to many downtown business owners and other people affected by, and it certainly is a problem, but it, a lot of it is a problem of perception. Um, Councillor Van Dyke has just told you that there's um, little violent crime from this community. I think Councillor McGrogan and I could confirm that through our other jobs. Or he's retired now, but um, <laughs> it was rare that there was violence, often violence between that group. Um, but not towards others. Um, Medicine Hat is much safer than you think that it is. If you see someone that doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, doesn't, you know, is like smelling like cigarette smoke or looking a bit grubby, that doesn't mean they're violent and homeless and a drug addict. And I think that those assumptions that we make say something about ourselves, which is not very pretty. It's a very pretty city with uh, some judgment there. That being said, <laughs> that being said, because of these different boards that I sit on, I am I am aware of all of the issues that Mayor Clark has talked about and how it's more complicated than just where you live. It's so much more, so much more than that. Um, uh, I choose to live in the flats for a reason. I want my children to see real people um, from a bunch of different socioeconomic <clears throat> backgrounds. I don't want them to simply think they're living a life of privilege. I sure didn't. My dad worked in downtown Grand Prairie, which was a lot rougher place um, than downtown Medicine Hat, I'll tell you that. Um, so that was my experience as a kid. And uh, I, I just don't think you can build or you can call on the next generation of helpers if you never allow them to see the people they're supposed to be helping. And so I want to encourage people to, to check your privilege sorry, I'm just going to say it to check your privilege and say, what really is my concern about coming downtown? And if it is a safety concern, the downtown patrol unit, like there's lots of things going on. If it's a perception thing, think about that. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the business owners. And when I speak to business owners, they tend to have a lot of compassion for this population, even though it has affected their businesses. They have a lot of compassion. And, you know, all credit goes to them for being um, thoughtful and going out and speaking to the, the 
people and getting to know them better and sometimes asking them to do work at their businesses. There, there's a lot of really caring people downtown. And so we hear a lot of people saying this is a problem and I won't go downtown and I just want people to think about why they're saying that. What have they actually experienced that makes them say that? And yes, thank you for that. <clears throat> and and if they if they can't come up with an answer within yourself, then just try it. Uh, um, I was my girls take piano lessons downtown, and so there's often people walking <laughs> at that time of day from the Salvation Army over to the mustard seed. You might see this little like trail of people as they're moving from one place to get a, a meal or do laundry or get a haircut over at mustard seed, and. Um, one time, I, went, I, I like to let them go on their own because they're little, but they're not that little that they shouldn't be independent. And so sometimes people will go by and I'll think, I wonder what they're thinking about that person. And then <laughs> they'll come in the van and they'll say, so did you see, notice anything different? Oh, that guy was really nice. I said hi to him and he said hi back. Like they're, the percent, you, you can be taught this. At the same time, I want people to be safe. And I have had the experience of, Again, a conversation, tough conversation with my kids. I went to go get some money out of the CIBC downtown, and there was three people um, sleeping in the, in there. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go to another bank. And so they, they said, why, why? And I said, because there's three of them and one of me. And I'm a tough, scrappy kid from Grand Prairie, but I can't take three people. And then they laugh and laugh. I'm like, what? But really, I don't know what to expect in this situation, so I'm just going to be careful. So I understand where there is safety concerns, but I think we have to really say. Why do we think that? If it's your own personal experience and something bad has happened to you, that's terrible. But that's not what the police are seeing and that's not my experience working downtown and living in the flats either. Well, and it's interesting, your, um, you know, your example, you're not describing it as a traumatic thing or anything. It's just, well, this is happening, so I'll deal with it in this way. We don't need to make a big deal of these things all the time. Any other comments from the panel on this one? I'd like to add just some specific things. The question was asked about, uh, you know, is there some place besides the library where people can go? Of course, we're open to everyone, but I would share that um, uh, this summer, we actually had a very good summer, knock wood. Um, you know, we uh, had a lot of people in the building, but um, didn't really have any major problems or almost none at all. Uh, like we feel like there are day shelters or there's opportunities for, for people. So that is the case. We're actually in a pretty good place right now. That's my experience. Um, the uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, around um, uh, the downtown patrol is excellent. We work with them all the time. They their hearts are in the right place, and uh, we find we just get almost instant response from the police when we call when we have to call. So we're very happy with that, and we feel like you know uh, a one job is being done on that level. And uh, just that idea, you know, uh, why are people allowed to victimize people? Um, I don't, you know, no. I would just share that in my experience with social agencies, there's no coddling. Nobody has an overly permissive attitude or anything like that. It's just really nobody is in that mind frame that I know of. Next question. <clears throat> the aesthetic upkeep efforts of the city were noticeably less this year. Can we look forward to our city looking amazing and something to, to be proud of again next year. I just have to say as a caveat or as a disclaimer or whatever, <clears throat> our uh, uh, findings were the best I've ever seen this year. So that wasn't my experience. But. What was that, Councillor? Um, our plantings here at the yeah. library, they were the best I've ever seen this year. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. well done. And the hanging baskets in downtown. Downtown looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely amazing. So do, do any of you share the perception that sort of things are slipping? No? Yeah, absolutely. No? Yeah. I, I, but I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree. I think the citizens are right in what they're seeing. I, uh, you know, I've reached out to the parks uh, managing director several times, and he's running trying to keep up with this. So I'll let Ramona explain what has happened. But they are very, uh, they're re very reactionary. If I phoned them and I said, "Look, it's really bad in this area," that they've actually ran after it and got it all done. They're really trying to keep up with it. But I'll let Ramona explain why. Yeah. So. Um it's a bit of a glitch this year. So traditionally, the um, the weeds on the boulevards, which are the parts that probably bother us most when we drive past them, are um, maintained by or stopped. Maintain who maintains a weed, but <laughs> are prevented by um, municipal works. And this year, it was turns over to Parks and Rec. So there were some pains in the transition from one unit to the other. I think those are all sorted out in a few ways. Contractors who jumped in and helped. And I know this because we talked about it at public services. So this isn't secret information. It wasn't an open meeting and we did discuss the weed problem at some length there. Not that you have to watch 
I don't think you can watch, but and they just tell you what we were taught. We debate, not debated it, but discussed it for some length of time. Um, so the contractors who came out and worked really hard to fix the problem as quickly as they could, we were very impressed with them. And then Municipal Works as well said, you know what, Parks and Rec, this is a tough transition. And they filled in. And so we were able to do um, a lot of coverage of the weeds. But of course, with the hot sun, they had gotten pretty wild. So it took a while to get through and they're still working on it. But we learned a lot. Um, Parks and Rec learned a lot about how to handle and avoid that next year. So next year, you should see a prettier looking medicine hat, <laughs> except <laughs> no, the except at Gershaw Drive area. Um, so the sort of the backstory there, it's not looking good. And I've had many people, like just friends comment to me, like it used to look so nice coming from Lethbridge and now it looks so bad. What's going on there? And then I said, oh, I can look into it. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. But I like when my friends are pointing it out and they don't want me to to make a fuss about it, but they're kind of curious, then it kind of makes me curious as well. And I don't drive there very often to notice it, but uh, last time I was <laughs> coming back from Lethbridge, I'm like, man, that really doesn't look very good at all. But um, what happened was the irrigation there failed. And so um, Robert was there, he could say 2019 or something. There was a $1.7 million ask of council to fix that irrigation. Or maybe they didn't ask, but they said, should we fix it? Because there's supposed to be a revamping of that whole intersection by the government of Alberta because we don't that's not our land and we sort of maintain it there but that's just by agreement it's actually government of Alberta um, yeah. land that were traditionally irrigated and that's why it looked so nice but when the irrigation fa failed then the choice at the time when there was you know like penny pinching happening for sure is if this is going to be revamped in a few years yesterday do we need to spend 1.7 million dollars on irrigation so the choice was not to do that. So that's why you're seeing that. So then the next choice was let's naturalize it. Well, that has not worked nearly as well as as uh, staff had hoped it would. <laughs> sort of like when I naturalize my back alley, then that, it's not a good look back there. So um, it's natural and, and then it's not so lovely. You could put a sign up for mom. I could put a sign up, naturalize, leave yeah. it alone. Zary escaped or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think that the that needs, there's work being done on what else we could do to make that area look um, much better than it does. But I don't think that the solution that's going to be proposed, although it might, is to spend the one point six. Well, now, years later, it's probably more like $2.5 million on irrigation. And for that small area, does that make a lot of sense when you're balancing what's what looks nice, what makes us proud as a city versus what you want to pay for taxes? It may not make the cut, and it didn't before, and it may again, or it may not, or it may be the, geo the government of Alberta comes up with some solution to it. So um, I guess the main point is that we're well aware of the areas that don't um, look like they used to, and there's progress being made on the boulevards where there's weeds. This one area of the city still needs some serious discussion of what's the best thing to do. But that discussion will happen because it's parks and rec, doing the work now at public services. So it's definitely on our radar to keep talking about. Allison? If I can just add something to that. So one of the issues that is always a huge annoyance for me, and I know for other people, because I've heard it many times in the community, is also that there's a lot of trees that have died in those areas, and that's because of the irrigation sure. failure and, and the drought that we've been experiencing for so many years now. So many trees have died in those areas, and I know that the city is looking at um, a plan to try and um, maybe work with, especially in those government of Alberta areas, to remove those dead trees um, before trying to figure out what to do with the property. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question is an interesting one to me. Um, is the waterfront district still being pursued? What's happening with that? I can start and then maybe throw it over to someone on the DNI committee. Uh, the waterfront district as a concept is in our long-term municipal development plan and so that's a very long long-term document um typically i think it's it's a 40-year plan um so the the concept of what the waterfront uh, district is in that or that was kind of perceived to be was just an idea at that time and so uh, well, it's it is still in our municipal development plan. What that eventually ends up looking like, or when that is eventually funded, will um, depend on on the council of the day. Uh, 
though we did um, continue to look at the waterfront redevelopment area plan. That's not what it's called, but something like that. So that we're uh, looking at what uh, is possible and uh, trying to um, make sure that development is well planned out and um, we know kind of what is needed when the time comes to start development in that area. Um, does anyone on the DNI committee want to weigh in as well? I can weigh in. Um, so I was there when the uh, riverfront um, waterfront district was envisaged. I think some of the challenges, and I'm going to try and be brief, but were around the fact that there was a uh, an opportunity presented to us because we uh, we were eager to um, see investment in particular downtown, um, which was a focus for many years. The, the parking lot, kitty corner from City Hall, um, you can um, count as many iterations of proposed development as I can on one hand, and certainly uh, many of them were were tried but never able to uh, be pursued based on business plans or costing. But the, the waterfront uh, re district isn't just the downtown, it is it, it includes the escarpment or the area near Athletic Park, the old arena site, all the way uh, across. And, and uh, as the mayor said, it's a long-term vision um, and it involves redevelopment of some of the properties across from the police service and the remand center. There are a lot of, a lot of properties and um, sometimes uh, you have to dare to create a vision before you can see um, investment happen. And that was the goal there. I think what, what maybe railroaded it a bit was there was a, a, a visual that was put out without um, public consultation in a meaningful way around what could be. And that became the living document. That became the li living image of what will happen. And of course, part of that conversation involved closing or the proposed closing of the river road behind City Hall or creating a, um, a median in the middle um, and having traffic uh, come from both ends. Long and short is we heard a lot of feedback about that and it hadn't even really been the plan. It was just a vision. And again, it was to stir up um, interest in, in uh, investment. So currently um, what we still see, and it kind of segues into the next question is really around uh, what do we do with these properties? We have one of the last few remaining uh, properties along a river uh, that I that I know of and um, we take it for granted those of us that live here we we think of it as the old arena site or we think of it as um, that piece of land across from Tim Hortons on first street and we we can't see um, sometimes the the value of that property but there are investors who will and investment has the opportunity to grow in itself and so if we can attract the right person the right investment in, in the uh, waterfront district proper, uh, it will have a cascading and uh, repeating effect. And that's that's how economic development works. Um, it's kind of like if somebody in your neighborhood, and we're talking about neighborhoods that maybe are, are, are becoming uh, some concern or an eyesore, when you see somebody move in and take over that property and put um, some investment in their property, both visually and aesthetically, as far as uh, their landscaping is concerned, all of a sudden there's this there's this um, uh, rippling effect that occurs. People start to see value and either put their own investment into it, or others will purchase, acquire those properties, and reinvest. And um, the waterfront district is the same thing. It's it's a vision. It's long term, and it's supposed to uh, support economic development and. And that's something we sorely need. So um, I think that's what I wanted to say on that. And just to build on that, as um, Councillor Dumanowski said, it does include the downtown and um, the city does have a um, waterfront district vibrancy incentive that allows owners of properties in the downtown and the waterfront area to access funds um, matching up to $50,000. Uh, so that they can make improvements on their properties within the, the waterfront area, including downtown. And that program was fully subscribed as of August 18th. So um, hopefully we see the fruits of, of those investments soon. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Panel, your um, excellent uh, and in-depth answers uh, to the questions are burning up all of our time. <laughs> uh, we have more questions and time left at this point. So I'm going to start to um, cherry pick a little bit, I think, here. Uh, and uh, the questions next... are people. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> questions. Everybody gets to stay. Um, we're going to move into the arts, culture, and recreation. And the next question is actually for me, but I did submit it through the form, so that's legitimate <laughs> in my mind. <clears throat> so let me read the question to you here. Yeah, sure. The, the f future of Medicine Hat's recreational facilities uh, is being decided right now in a planning process called Facilities for the Future. And, and as I understand it, this process was started because we have big decisions to make. Uh, we have end of life pools and things like that. And we have to make big decisions about whether to renew infrastructure or do something new. So as I understand it, the process is really focused on athletic uh, facilities because that's the challenge, um, the immediate um, challenge that needs to be addressed. But I do know uh, with rec centers, um, sometimes, um, uh, you know, things can be combined and even things like libraries can be uh, co-located with uh, recreational facilities. Um, and I'm not lobbying for anything, um, <laughs> but uh, I do just want to ask, how will you ensure that uh, new facilities live up to their full broad potential and uh, re uh, realize uh, sort of visionary results while still focusing on resolving the existing problems? I can start. Uh, yeah, so that's an excellent question, and I've had a lot of conversations with um, different organizations and municipalities in, in relation to facilities for the future. I think the um, one of the main things to deliver long-lasting, um, really value-added value facilities in our community is partnerships and collaboration with not just the school system, but other the region, the other municipalities that are bordering us, um, as well as talking to facilities like the library and making sure that it is really, um, they are really facilities that meet the needs of our community. And that also could, you know, include discussions of, um, you know, other, other, you know, whether it's a school district or another municipality uh, working together and funding together uh, these these facilities so that everybody benefits and it's less expensive maybe for any one individual. But when we're going, for example, for grants or funding from the province uh, or the federal government, for that matter, it's so much more powerful when you go as a group, when you go as a partnership to um, say, we, we have aligned, we all agree that this would benefit all of us. And so that's why we think you should give us the money. So um, looking forward to more of those consultations over the coming um, weeks, months, years to really zone in on how these facilities can be a benefit to our, our region and the other partners in our community. Thank you. Councilor Heider. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. Um, exactly what Mayor Clark said to collaborate with the, the surrounding area as well. Um, I just have to say, uh, Brian South and, and his crew, James Will, came forth with the facilities for the future plan. And it was fantastic. I think all of us have been waiting patiently and eagerly to see what the plan was. Um, just to, people need to know we would never close one until we had another. So there would never be, um, we'd never be without a skating rink or, or things like that. There'd always be a plan. Um, but for myself, and I think um, Councillor Robbins as well, we sit on public service and I don't, I can't speak for her, but I was very excited to see what the future holds. And um, I think the community will be blown away by, I mean, it's going to, of course, there'll be money and it's an investment, but it'll be an investment in the future. Um, like when James was presenting and he said the family, or sorry, Big Marble Go, um, is 23 years old already, when you think of that. And you, and it's crazy that time's gone by. So you do need to prepare for things. And, and having awesome facilities like what they presented will only attract families, will only attract uh, different reasons to come to the community. So I'm, yeah, very excited. And we won't forget the library. <laughs> Thanks for humoring me. Yes, of course. <laughs> Councillor Reddick. Yes, thank you. I'm not on public services anymore, but I just, I am a well-known library lover. So I just <laughs> wanted to comment on this and that I think that probably when it comes to the, uh, the market, uh, 
survey that they plan to do at the start of this that maybe there will be some consultation with community around these kinds of things but we see in other communities where there's this very successful blending of rec facilities and libraries in the south part of calgary there's a ymca library school combination that serves that area really well and i I would love to see uh, more library facilities available around the city, especially in the south where we have a large population of young families um, that are maybe underserved in that area. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's jump into other, see how far. <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of time. We might jump back to recreation and, and things. So the obvious uh, thing really around is around utilities that have been on people's minds um, a lot. And uh, we have three questions that are related to that. And I'm just going to read them uh, a little bit from each one of them and uh, sort of let you answer them as a whole. Uh, what are the recommended changes to our utility rates and structure to provide long-term affordability and sustainability for all residents and business businesses? Has this been in discussion? So I think this is the, you know, the longer term kind of uh, answer. What is it going to be? Um, what's the plan for these bills at a time when the budget is stretched beyond? Uh, fear for homelessness in the winter are running high amongst the population. Um, I, I, I do hear this. This is one that I hear that there are a lot of people that are in major economic pain and it's serious pain. It's not just utilities, it's rent. There's a whole, it's a perfect storm of inflation and uh, pressures like that. But certainly the, the, the pain is real and the uh, for people. And the last one is just about um, the structure of the uh, 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 the relief payments that are being made. Thank you very much for, for, for doing that, responding in that way. Um, but the point is made that, uh, you know, everybody's getting the same amount and some people might actually turn a profit and other people, their losses won't be completely covered. Anybody want to comment on the, the, that utilities issue? I'll, I'll comment on it quickly because um Whenever someone <laughs> talks about the utility bill, I have two questions for them. What was your usage last month? And have you signed into one of the rates or not? And if they can't answer those questions, then I say, you know, there's, you need to do some research to, to plan your life. So I will say this, I, I would, with that money, make money on, it's <laughs> just, a, I don't use a lot of electrical. I don't know what I'm doing with my time, but apparently not much. <laughs> There's like my computer and that's pretty much it. I don't run much air conditioning. I've said this at a couple of council meetings and my sister has rolled her eyes. Why do you keep telling people that? I say, because there might be people in a position like me who haven't used a lot of uh, electrical and who were on a fixed rate. And so it didn't make a huge difference to me in this summer. I know that's not the case for a lot of people, but those people like me, I just would encourage you to donate your, $800 to community warmth because there will be people unlike me who will who will not be able to afford it and it'll make a difference for them for sure and so um, just for those who may make some profit on that um, and I know if you've got other costs like it's cost relief it's not just about utilities I know groceries are more expensive and but if you're in, if you're like me and you just didn't find a big swing difference that sort of shocked you or alarmed you please donate to community community warmth that uh, that, uh, those extra funds. Thank you for that suggestion because I've kind of, I'm a little feel a little guilty because I'm in that situation. I'm going to get yeah. back more almost you know uh, hesitant to say so, but I, I love that idea. I love that idea. Thank you for that. Yeah. So oh, sorry. Uh, I think we have Councillor Van Dyke. Yes. Thank you. So I I don't know if these questions came forward prior to our last council meeting. Um, because I think it was covered fairly exhaustively in the media yes. that we have um, approved these cost, pres cost pressure relief measures of uh, funds to residential and business owners, as well as um, administration will be bringing forward in the next couple of council meetings um, potential um, utility pricing options going forward as an interim measure until we have a full evaluation of our utility business. Now that last piece is going to take a long time. Probably I'm guesstimating here, but I'm thinking about a year. So we'd be looking at that interim um, pricing options in the meantime, but we anticipate those coming, I believe, uh, in two council meetings. So it's fair to say that those rebates are really just a very short-term stopgap measure and there might be something a little bit more um, granular or fine-tuned for a little bit longer period before a permanent solution is found, is that right? Uh, yeah, the relief measures are, are like, yes, an interim um, kind of solution um, around, as Councillor Robin said, 
higher prices in all areas of our lives these days. But um, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a process to kind of figure out some of those things. Thankfully, we have subject matter experts that this is all that they do and think about and dream about and spend their free time doing that will uh, bring that information to us at, at council so that we can discuss it and, and choose something going forward in the best interest of our community. And um, the other thing that I had just wanted to point out that in addition to the the current relief measures coming that um, we recognized over a year ago that there was pressures on people in our community that um, are really in a vulnerable position. And so we had approved a fair entry program as well, which did not previously exist before the last budget. And so that is available as well for community members. And that's not just um, around these sorts of things, but on rec facilities and um, arts programming through the Esplanade and public transit, which can be really beneficial to people as well. So I really encourage people in the community to check that out on the city website. Uh, so just in case people don't know, for residential, it's 200 per month for um, four months. So that, that will be doubled up um, in your September 18th bill. So it'll be August and September, you'll get in September. So that'll be $400. And then you'll get $200 for the, the following two months. For business, it was $500 per month and it'll be allocated um, in the same way. Uh, we were advised that the affordability relief couldn't be delivered in a pro rata, um, like according to uh, what your usage was. This is recognized um, as a fairly significant issue, especially with business, where some businesses are just necessarily energetically expensive, whereas others are not. So um, that that is a challenge that um, well, it didn't get resolved now. Uh, the new rates, the, the rate option coming forward, we hope to see something more of best of market. I think, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, we, everybody loves choice, but it has to be simple. It has to be something that people can um, easily understand. And sometimes, you know, it's just give me the best rate. And I think that's what we heard. Um, if there is people that think they look at their bill, they look at their usage and they think, wow, this is bananas. This can't possibly be right. Uh, call customer service because it may be that there is another issue going on that um, has a resolution. And so I would encourage people to call customer services to, to ha take a look into their billing or their metering and just make sure everything is um, as it should be. Thank you, Councillor Heidi. Thanks, Ken. Um, when uh, Mayor Clark talks about customer care, um, those individuals that work in that department are just, to me, um, are doing a really amazing job. They take the time with um, people when they call in. It's a stressful time uh, when it in regards to utilities and people trying to figure out um, where their money can be spent and those individuals that work there are really truly trying to help and Do the best they can for the the people on the other end um, So I need to recognize them they as well as our communications department that are working hard to communicate What is going on with our utilities whether it's on the website or or in the social media? So I would not want to be on the end of that phone as it's ringing straight so i really hats off to those people thanks for that i'm sure you're on the end of some phone at some point <laughs> uh, <yeah, yeah. laughs> any other comments on that actually i will ken sure. uh, i brought it up in the council meeting and i just want to reiterate it so it was back in you know i've been having lots of conversations as we all have and one of the comments we always get is well why don't you just do the best rate right to begin with why are you making us choose and i think we need to kind of have a little bit of a history lesson and go back um we are we have these different rates because I and I think it was 2009. My memory's not great, but where the community said, "Hey, why are you picking our rates for us? Like, why can't we have a choice? Calgary and Edmonton have a choice. Why can't we have a choice?" So that's where that choice came from. So it is okay that we now want that changed. I think if anything, it shows that uh, administration is able to pivot quite quickly and make those changes for us. But so I just want everybody to remember because sometimes that lesson in history is. There wasn't a council that just said, I wonder how much money we can make off our taxpayers. That's just not happened. It's it's just not the way it is. No, it isn't. 
<laughs> so, but it is very important that they understand. Um, yeah, there was no ill intent as choices came forward. Now, if the population wants that to change, you know, I think this council is hearing what they want. Thank you. <clears throat> I can't resist asking this question. When can the issue of urban chickens well. be tabled again? What else <laughs> needs to happen to persuade councillors who are still, still holding out to change their mind? I'm out. I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, it could come forward at any time. It was we the briefing note that came forward in 2022. I want to say September 2022 was just the question of do you want to consider this council and it was defeated five to four I can't tell you what would convince the councillors that did not vote for it uh, what would make them change their mind but I think certainly um, a lot of other uh, cities in Alberta and across Canada have piloted these types of programs and um, it has been been run very successfully in those areas and provides some element as well of uh, food security and um, I so I that's my point of view but uh, obviously um, public input is very important so uh, if you can think of of great arguments please let us know I want to weigh in on. Oh, I have. To, I, have I, to I didn't too. know this was going to be the passion I have point. To too. After all, let Andy of go all first. All the stuff that we've been through, all the complex issues, we're talking chickens. So, uh, um, I just want to say that uh, I did vote for the chickens. because I, I don't think it's a big deal, actually. He wants uh, chickens. My son lives in Calgary. They have chickens. You don't even know they're there, except he gets you know a bunch of eggs every day and. They quite like the interaction. So I think, I, w I hope we do revisit it. I, I don't see an issue. I know Grand Prairie instituted a, a program and they just went from four chickens, I think, to six because they've had zero complaints in two years on the program. So uh, I, I hope it's revisited and uh, I'll vote the same way again, unless, unless of course, I'm convinced to change my mind. <laughs> Councilor Hyder, how about you? How well, you? <laughs> I just would like, Ken, I mean, look at these awesome people. I can't really see them, but I think there's people out there. there. Are, and uh, we Vandalites. should have a show of hands tonight. Who wants chickens? <laughs> Who wants chickens? Yeah. It's pretty split. Yeah. I don't know. It's I mean, pretty split. You know, I just, um, <laughs> Ken, I, 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 I have to say that I disagree with the chickens. Um, I came from uh, Lake Lindsay, more of a ranching background, and chickens belong out in the country. But maybe, like Andy says, I could be persuaded. You know, sometimes you just got to give in. There's, There's less romance. Not even the loud exhaust system. <laughs> or the barking dogs. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I knew that's Jack. I can see Jack. Pardon me? Yep, yep, for sure. Chicken host. I think there's less romance with it if you've actually lived beside <laughs> it. This might be the dynamic that's happening there. I have one more question that I really, uh, this one I seriously do want to ask. It's, it's a simple question, but a powerful one to me. And I think it'll be the last one that we're, we're going to ask given the time. Um, how do you specifically plan to involve young people uh, mm. in decision making? I. Mm. Go ahead. Are you. Or yeah, go ahead. No, go first. It's a great question. We used to have a youth advisory board, um, and I think like we moved now to a community vibrancy board, which is one entire organization. But I think that there is potential for. Uh, I would like to see a bit more um, uh, bottom up from from youth telling us, you know, what they what they want to see. What is their vision for the city? What would make them stay? Um, I know you have a very active youth um, committee at the library Tic -tac, and yeah. Tic Tac. Maybe, you know, we can tap into that a little bit. But um, ultimately, if you are going to have committees like that, the city administration and city council has to actually be willing to listen to what they're saying and and uh, mm -hmm. um, pursue some of their ideas or, or else it will just be. You know why am I participating on this committee if I if you just keep telling me no to everything? But um, yeah, I I hope that we can I, whether it's through a committee or through just like going to where youth are and talking to them uh, that we can definitely you know start to better understand what the what the vision of our young people is for our city. Thank you. 
Okay, Ken. Um, in my other job, um, I run this little place called the Ronald McDonald House at Medicine Hat. Ken knows that. Um, and the um, Community Foundation in our, commu in our city does a wonderful youth and philanthropy program. And I've had the opportunity to talk to um, kids um, at different high schools, junior highs, and even elementary. And it's just part of being in, it's a way for them to feel involved and influential in their community. They get the choice to, um, you know, do some fundraising perhaps and give back to the community. And I do flip it around a bit and they, they talk about what they'd like to see, you know. And so starting with them when they're in grade three or grade six and having these conversations and why they want to give back and what they like to see um, is definitely um, a way to engage with them. They come up with some really interesting and cool forward thinking ideas, like even grade six kids. It's really neat. So um, thanks to Nikki and her crew at the Community Foundation for having that program and being able to um, have youth have a voice in the city. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Councillor Van Dyke. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I just wanted to read, um, I know probably people don't care about our strategic vision that council spent multiple days working on, but we do have a point in there under community wellness, which is 5.10 that says, consider the needs of youth and their importance in our community in current policy development with the aim of creating a community where youth want to live and stay. And so we are very cognizant as a group of, of the needs for youth and their futures in our community. A lot of us are parents and we want to see our children thrive in this community and either choose to stay or choose to come back after they're f completed their educations. And so, and I think uh, one thing that happened really early on in our term was that we uh, changed the bylaw about skateboarding downtown. So previously that had been not allowed and we had a lot of youth come to us and say they wanted that change. So we recognized that and, and made that change. And I think we're all open to hearing the needs of our community. I know a lot of us are involved uh, with our through our children in other um, kind of youth-led organizations too. So we're probably quite aware of, of the needs in the community. And I know that the city administration, when they do plans now, um, like for example, the Parks and Rec Master Plan, they went into classrooms and did surveys with youth about kind of their vision for public spaces and for parks. Some of them were very fun, not just for the kids, but for their parents too. So I think we um, are aware, and, and like Mayor Clark said, we used to have a youth advisory, but we all know advisories can be toothless. And, and I would hope that if we move forward with something like that in the future, that we are uh, taking the recommendations and actually implementing them. Do you have something? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, many of you know I work with children and youth. I've been doing that for almost 29 years now. And um, I can I can definitely uh, add to what was said earlier. The late um, Mayor Garth Fellow, he, um, he came into office and instituted the Mayor's Youth Advisory Board. And, and not to suggest that future mayors did away with it. Some of the challenges that came with it were, um, you have to you had to identify certain age groups that that could meaningfully um, have that kind of discourse, and and you had to identify a process to which you would you would pick members. But it was a fair um, process. But it, often it was a struggle to find members, quite frankly, and that's not. Uh, because there's a lack of voice out there. I think it was just the mechanisms. The other issues I know we identified or I heard, I recall was uh, the, the, the terms often started and ended mid grade. So a child mm -hmm. or a student who may have been in grade 11 or grade 12 would join and then all of a sudden they're in college. And so there were some, some logistical challenges with that. But in the end, the voice of the youth is, is important. Um, and so just thinking about um, my experiences in, the, in a school setting, there's no shortage of ideas, but we also have to uh, help them understand that when they come to these, uh, whatever means they use to, to um, use their voice to lend, lend to the development of a community or whatever project they're working on, it's not just ask and you will get, right? Um, 
I have youth who often ask me to add a McDonald's onto the back of my school, but we, we can't just do that. So, um, but I was thinking, you know, we're having a town hall and that's something we, we never really did a lot before this. So um, we had one at the Viner Center, we're having one here, the chamber is having one. Why not have a youth one and, and invite the youth and really populate the idea through our school systems and give them an opportunity to see their elected officials and ask them the tough questions. They might be tougher than this crowd. Yeah. So. Exactly. I see our PR advisor is making a note. Thank you. The Canadian age of medicine hat is 44. People under 18 can't vote. The dominant voting group is 50 plus in this city. So whatever they bring forward, if it's not appealing to people of 50 plus age, they're going to be out voting. It's, it's a structure of democracy itself. How would you address that? Uh, I think that comes back to the question about leadership. So our job as a council is not to just focus on whether we'll get reelected or, you know, who, what groups we need to keep, keep pleased so that we can get reelected, but it's to be visionary and really look, not look out, not just for our city right now, but our city into the future. And we can't do that without considering what uh, young people want out of their city. Uh, so it is, it, it certainly is the case that our demographic is getting um, older, but if we don't look towards the youth, that, that trend will continue. And that's not a great situation if we're not, you know, having a, a larger population of youth and young families in our, in our city. If I can just step in at this point, um, it is uh, just coming up on 10 minutes to 8. Um, the library does close at 8. So uh, I am going to ask that uh, we conclude uh, tonight. I'm very sorry that we didn't get to uh, uh, the questions that were submitted tonight. We didn't even get through the list of questions that were, were put uh, up before the event. So that's just uh, the way it goes. We've really run out of time. So uh, uh, in order to let library staff um, leave and get home to their families and everything and uh, for us to close the library at uh, at our regular time of eight o'clock. Uh, we are going to conclude now and I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and I really want to thank the panel for um, uh, making time this evening for us. Thank, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. And thank you. This was very enjoyable. I, I would but like good. to say and thank you for hosting and for the people that came. Um, I've this was really nice and uh and why shouldn't it be and why shouldn't it be so i appreciate i appreciate you guys thank you